everyone. I think people are still uh, joining in right now. So uh, thank you, first of all, for joining today, uh, our webinar on communicating affordability and the energy transition. First, uh, quickly, just a little bit about us. Clean Energy Canada is a program at Simon Fraser University's Morris J. Wask Center for Dialogue, where we work to accelerate the transition to clean energy. Uh, here at Clean Energy Canada, we inform policy leadership, we drive public engagement, convene stakeholder dialogues, and we conduct original research. That includes research, um, communications research, which is the focus of today's webinar. I am also joined today by my co-host, David Coletto. Hi, David. Uh, who can speak more about himself shortly. Uh, David is the CEO and founder of Abacus Data. You likely know Abacus, but if not, they're one of Canada's leading polling and market research firms. Uh, in terms of our roadmap for today, we'll keep it pretty simple. David and I will first explain why we did this research and how we did this research. We will then explain uh, what we learned and perhaps most usefully, uh, usefully rather, uh, which arguments were most effective at persuading people that clean energy is a cost of living solution as opposed to a problem. After that, we'll offer a few more general communications tips and then open this webinar to questions for the last 20 or so minutes. Uh, but before we start, and while everyone is still plugging in, I will quickly cover a bit of housekeeping. Uh, first, uh, if you have any technical issues or questions, you can ask them through the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom webinar screens. Our senior communication specialist, Carrie McNamara, will do her best to troubleshoot them for you. Uh, you may need to move your mouse over the screen or toward the bottom of the screen in order for the Zoom menu to appear. Uh, as mentioned, we'll be welcoming your questions in the final 20 minutes of this webinar. Please submit them through the same Q&A icon we just mentioned. Feel free to ask a question at any time during the webinar and we'll be compiling them for later. Number three, feel free to share highlights from this webinar on social media. We will circulate a recording of the webinar and a summary of our findings to all who registered, which you're also free to share. And four, and finally, if you enjoy what you hear today, consider signing up to the Clean to Clean Energy Canada's weekly newsletter, the Clean Energy Review, co-authored by myself and our producer of this webinar, Carrie. I think uh, David has a newsletter as well, which I get and is fantastic. Um, if you're just joining us now, thanks for participating in today's webinar. I'm Trevor Melanson, Communications Director at Clean Energy Canada. Uh, so why did we conduct qualitative public opinion research around the energy transition as it relates to people's cost of living. Honestly, perhaps the answer to that question is somewhat painfully obvious. Personally, I can think of no two forces right now that are more anxiety inducing than the existential threat of climate change and the very personal threat of rising living costs. The latter is the most salient political issue out there right now, and short of another COVID curveball, I suspect that will remain true for a while, certainly after the next federal election expected in 2025 or even sooner. I'll quickly steal one of David's stats, and that's that over 90% of Canadians right now rank a pocketbook issue as a top concern that would impact their vote. So it matters whether people think the energy transition was making life more affordable for them, or less affordable, and I think it matters a lot. We don't want Canadians thinking they have to choose one over the other, or I, I would worry what they would choose. But it is a false choice. Indeed, we have an ace in our sleeve, and it's the truth. The clean energy transition will actually decrease over overall household energy costs for most people, not increase them, a topic we're gonna to explore later in this webinar. But perhaps just as important is perception. Regardless of what's true, what do people believe? And if they don't believe it, what would make them believe it? As Clean Energy Canada's communications director, a big part of my job is reminding people that the argument that persuades a policy advisor isn't necessarily the one that's gonna break through with most Canadians. Clean Energy Canada has been working with Abacus for many years now. We've done polling together, we've hosted focus groups. In this summer, we tried something a little bit different. On that note, I will pass the proverbial mic over to David to talk a little bit more about that. Well, well thanks, Trevor. Uh, great to be here. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Trevor said, we've worked uh, well together and, and quite a bit over the last number of years um, doing both polling and, and some qualitative work. 
Avacus, uh, for those that don't know, we're a, a national research company. Uh, we do polling market research with offices in Ottawa and Toronto. I've I've been in this this business now for over a decade, and you know, we, we designed a study. And, and Carrie, if you want to um, put up the the slides, we'll start to get into the actual content of, of of the study itself and and really what our objectives were. I think you know when Trevor reached out and said, "Look, we want to we want to understand how these two big issues are kind of intersecting with each other." You know, Trevor mentioned. Um, some polling we've done just just two weeks ago, we did a survey, we asked Canadians, what are your top issues? Cost of living is, is for 73% is in their top three. Climate change is, is about 30%, right? Still high, relatively speaking to a lot of other issues. But there's one issue that's just consuming, um, you know, the vast majority of, of Canadians, Americans, you know, Brits, you name it, right? This is a global issue that that has affected it in the same way that climate change is a, is a global kind of existential threat in terms of the short and long term. So what we wanted to do is to really understand, as, as Trevor said, what are the perceptions and impressions of energy costs and concerns as they are today? We focused in on Ontario, as I, I'll get into the methodology in more detail, but I think what we learned in, in Ontario is, is uh, you know, applicable in most parts of the country. That's my, my sense. But we wanted to understand perceptions and impressions around um, energy costs and what is driving them and, and how they're affecting people in their day-to-day -day life. We want to understand the relationship between affordability and the clean energy transition. Do people see a direct link? What in what direction and, and why? And, and that's what really why we, we, we went deep and, and wanted to use qualitative methods to understand things. And then a big part of this study was to then understand how do we persuade people? So we, you know, Trevor and his team developed a number of messages and we put them in front of people to understand, you know, how do they respond? What motivates them to support the energy transition, the clean energy transition, despite what we have clearly heard in the early part of these, these conversations were deep concerns about affordability. So this is what we did on the next slide, uh, Carrie. Um, we had really two components, and they were both qualitative in nature, but we used two different methodologies to get at it. So the first one was we built what we call a short-term uh, online research community. So we recruited 45 uh, participants with, with varied age, gender, uh, you know, backgrounds, cultural, um, racialized communities, um, where they lived, but they were all in Ontario, and we invited them into a, a five-day, basically, task-based discussion slash conversation. Um, and the benefit of doing this is we didn't just bring people into a focus group, talk to them for an hour and a half, and then have them leave. We actually were able to watch as their views evolved over time. And so we were able to, you know, inst uh, put in stimulus, uh, share ideas. And we also had them interact with each other on discussion boards at times so that they could not just be isolated in a vacuum, but, but be exposed to what other people uh, were thinking and how they were responding. So it was this like real time, deliberative, um, qualitative moment that allowed us to, to sort of see the journey that people uh, would take. The other thing we, we purposely did was we selected a subset of these 45 uh, who live in more industrial kind of manufacturing auto, uh, particularly auto manufacturing communities within Ontario, particularly in Southern Ontario. So think of places like Windsor, Oshawa, Oakville, um, and, and tried to get at least a subset because we also wanted to understand um, the economic upside of a clean energy transition, whether people living in communities that even within uh, weeks of us doing these groups, um, announcements had been made about, you know, new battery plants or, or, you know, Stellaris, for example, in Windsor shifting production towards EVs. And so we wanted to get whether that was filtering down and what people felt about that. After the online community, we invited a, a number of those same people into actual live focus groups that were done on a platform like this on Zoom. And so we did two groups on August 4th with a group that was primarily from that uh, manufacturing base and then a group from the greater Toronto and Toronto area. And the purpose of these were to then go deeper and to actually see people um, um, both visually and to hear from their own mouths um, then respond to some of the same kinds of questions and, and go deeper into the conversation. So it was a really fascinating multi-prong um, design that was meant to, 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 to not quantitatively understand this, but from a qualitative perspective, um, what is the link between affordability and the clean energy transition? So let's talk about what we learned. 
I think the first thing and very briefly is that there's no doubt in my mind that uh, both in the summer when we did this study and I suspect even more so today, you know, Canadians and Ontarians are seized by concerns about the cost of living and inflation. Everyone's talking about it. When we ask people, you know, in these focus groups or in the early day, early stages of the, the online community, you know, what's on your mind? What do you, what's keeping you up at night? Uh, cost of living, affordability, make paying the bills, however they framed it, food, gas, um, housing, these were, these were the issues that really consumed everybody. I will say one of the things, by the way, the group that we invited, they had to believe in climate change, one, and two, they had to, you know, have, they didn't have to be the most, um, it wasn't their top, top issue, but we didn't want to speak to people who we felt you'd never convinced that didn't believe climate change was real or that we could do anything about it. So I will say that the folks we talked to um, weren't friendly, but they were friendlier than perhaps if we did a, a, a fully representative sample, because we wanted to understand those that think climate change is real and is something we need to do something about what role is affordability playing in it. So I just wanted to, to preface that. So cost of living uh, overwhelming too. The other thing we learned about this group is um, that action on climate change, and keep in mind, again, this was, this was happening uh, mere uh, weeks or, or you know, I, I remember, I think at the exact time I had just come back from the UK when we started these groups, the fires in London, the, the heat wave in Europe, you know, this is in the summer months when, when climate impacts are, are top of mind. Support for climate action was nearly universal. Right, everybody we um, not purposely recruited on this, but everybody um, said early on again that that climate change is, is 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 a significant challenge that we have to do something about, and there was a generally uh, pretty broad understanding of of actions taken by different levels of government, whether that be carbon pricing, uh, incentives for EVs, um, other kinds of things. They could articulate broad directions that governments were taking, which I think, based on past research that we've done with Clean Energy Canada and others uh, is a move forward. But the thing to always remember, and this is something that I think still shocks Trevor and I when we sit in focus groups, is just how little people can actually articulate how climate change happens or what we need to do to actually slow it down. It's improved, but that understanding of the how remains really undeveloped. And so it, it reminds us that we need to keep things still at a relatively high level speak in broad principles, but as we're going to suggest here, provide examples, right? Making it, it real and, and obvious for people in that kind of environment remains really important. Um, next slide, please. The third key finding were um, that, you know, when we, we put the somewhat trade-off in front of people and said, okay, you know, climate action more generally, uh, transition towards a clean energy uh, economy or the clean energy transition, most believed that in the short term, it would be more expensive for them. There was a pretty broad uh, belief that that was the case. But over time, uh, most people also said that their costs would be reduced. So there was this, this sense of, yeah, I think now, um, you know, this clean energy transition is going to cost me more. Action on climate change is going to cost me more. Most people said, I think we need to do it. But they were willing to admit and believe that, that it would cost. So that suggests some vulnerability. Um, on climate action as it relates to affordability. Um, on the other hand, and if you go to the next slide, when we ask them, you know, what are the potential positives and negatives of the so-called, and we explained what the clean energy transition was to them. If you look at these, and again, we, we would display these in quantitative numbers, but keep in mind, these are 45 people who answered this. So, you know, it, there's, it, it's not a representative sample, but it shows the pattern here, right? The dark green represents those who said, these are very positive impacts. And then you look at the orange, which signifies negative, and you see some ordering public health, improving air quality, protecting nature, stopping climate change. Overwhelming numbers think that the clean energy transition will have a positive impact on all of those. Then you get a second order kind of effects, right? Creating jobs, achieving net zero. You can have a whole other conversation to this. I don't think a lot of people really understand net zero, but nonetheless, um, it, it's, it's a little less intense you know, uh, improvements to the economy, both provincially and nationally. And then at the bottom there, cost of living. And the thing to take about away from this is yes, about half of those in our community said, you know, the clean energy transition would, this is their starting point, mind you, would be a positive for the cost of living. 
19% said it would have a negative, but there's a sizable group who say, I don't think positive nor negative, or I'm, I'm not sure. So it was the one item really where we saw some negativity and less intensity on the positive, right? So that suggested to us, um, we wanted to understand how would that view evolve as we, as we continue the conversation. Next slide, please, Carrie. So we went a little deeper, and one of the areas we wanted to understand was views around EV. Uh, Trevor's going to share some more data later, but we've done lots of polling, both in Ontario and nationally, around EV adoption and public perceptions around uh, EVs. But what's clear from the conversations we were happening, both in the community and then in the focus group, was that um, EV adoption is strongly linked to people's perception and understanding and conception of the clean energy uh, transition. It's the obvious image that people have when we think clean energy transition in their day-to-day -day lives, the most obvious thing that's going to change is the vehicle that they likely will drive. Um, but when we dig deeper, as you might expect, hurdles remain in terms of adoption. There's, there's still a lot of, I would say, misunderstanding, uh, misperception, misconception around cost and the front, you know, upfront cost versus the the savings that might come from it. There's a lot of uh, resistance to, to buying an EV today because of perceptions. I think some of them are real uh, in people's minds about the lack of a charging infrastructure. Remember, keep in mind, this is in Ontario, not in BC or other places that have seen much wider adoption of EVs. And as a result, I think infrastructure is better. And then there's still a lingering you know, concern about reliability. I always like to remind people that when we talk about even the internal combustion engine, most people have no idea how that works, but they've come to believe it does work, right? And, and most of the time, it, it, it does the job that it needs to do. You're, you're now asking people to imagine a completely different way uh, of that, that vehicle being propelled forward, and they've heard stories, and misinformation is, 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 is wide. So there still is, despite a real you I don't know, Trevor, if you felt it, I felt it like a deep intent to want to buy an EV and knowing that it's the right thing to do both for the environment, for climate action. And I think they kind of know long term, because the price of gas had spiked so high in the period that we were talking to them, that it was going to save them money. But they were still conflicted, right? And there was still this change is hard, I think is, is the answer to that. And we still saw people could easily find excuses why they couldn't buy an EV. And obviously for some, just supply of cars um, was an issue as well. So it's really important though, that EVs will become um, a big part of the story uh, around the transition, but it wasn't the only area we explored. So if we go uh, forward um, and I may have, yeah, number five is we also wanted to understand the economic opportunity. Now this is separate from the uh, affordability conversation but was linked because we were talking to folks in a part of the country where we had seen lots of announcements and news about different industries, not just automotive, but other industries kind of transitioning and using different forms of energy to produce, for example, steel in Hamilton. Um, and, and what we really understood too is that despite people understanding the opportunity for EVs to in, help support the transition, uh, there was, I think, a real understanding and acceptance that the transition um, and the industrial strategy that's going to be shifting is an economic opportunity. And I will say this happened in the context at a time, if you, if for those on the call who recall, we, we were uh, coming right out of a provincial election in June of, of, of this year. And at the start of that election, you had Justin Trudeau and, and the Premier uh, Doug Ford at, at that plant in, in Windsor. Um, but one of the things that was really interesting is for those who live in local environments where these industries form the backbone of their, their and perceptually of their economy, whether that's the automotive sector in places like Windsor or Oshawa, whether it's steel in Hamilton, they understood and had a clear articulation of what was going on. So when we talked about green steel, for example, um, uh, people in Hamilton were, were much more aware of that. And that just underscores the the importance of finding local examples to ex, ex, you know, explain a broader uh, story, right? That, that speaking broadly about the clean energy transition doesn't mean as much to people unless they can visualize or see an example in their own community or in their own experience that connects the dots together. On the next slide, 
um, I'll give you some, some examples here, right? And so we asked people, you know, to what extent are you aware uh, of a number of green energy, clean energy, excuse me, opportunities that are currently receiving investment and attention? Um, and you can see that there's, a, again, a clear uh, connection with EVs that's at the top of the list. Um, six and four, uh, six and 10 of the folks we talked to in these communities were very aware of it. Renewable power is also there. These are the things normally people will associate with the clean energy transition and the economic opportunities. But as you go down that list, um, you know, if you look at the sort of second half, mining, energy storage, clean hydrogen, low carbon or green steel making, low carbon chemicals and fertilizer, um, these have much lower awareness. Um, again, as I said, in some instances, folks from Hamilton, for example, you can see there is a little, there's a little intense 13% of our community that, that we're very aware of it. That's the Hamilton folks. Um, and so there's, there's an opportunity here to, to expand the conversation beyond EVs and renewable power and start talking about how the clean energy transition is happening in other parts of the economy in other sectors or in other parts of the supply chain uh, processes themselves. Uh, next slide, please. And I think I'm getting, oh, one more here. Um, we also tested some, some statements around believability uh, towards EVs. So you can see here, the first thing is lots of green, meaning almost all of these, or all of them had clear majorities of, of our community and our, our uh, participants saying they believe them to be true. Um, you know, EVs help cut pollution and combat climate change. Um, it costs less to charge an EV than fill up a gas, overwhelming numbers. Like I don't even have to read these all, but you can see you know, all of these statements uh, for the most part people believed. There is some friction again around an EV would suit all or almost all of my driving needs. This comes into you know, keeping in mind this study was done in Ontario, concerns about winter and, and, and you know, different people have different needs, but for the vast majority, all of these were, 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 tr were true to their minds and none of them um, were, were false. Things like though, governments aren't doing enough to help people get EVs. In Ontario, by the way, where we don't have any provincial uh, incentives, people agreed that that seems to be true. They want government to be doing more. Um, they bought into the idea that our, our electricity grid is already pretty clean. And so EVs are an effective way uh, to combat climate. People thought that true. Again, in Ontario, um, a, a lot of our electricity is either hydro or nuclear, and so that perception exists. So the point here is that there's a lot of not a lot of friction um, and and misperception around um, the role that EVs play um, in 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 moving things along. Uh, next slide, Carrie. I'm coming to the end. I think of my section here. I see your. Sorry, I think that is the next slide. Oh, sorry, you're right. It just looked the same. Um, more, more down this list here. Um, again, you can see, um, you know, uh, large numbers of people saying I would personally benefit from owning an EV. EV many people believe that EV wait lists are too long. Um, and now we start to see some differences of opinion, right? Where there's a lot of green and a lot of orange. Uh, EVs are more fun to drive than gas cars. There's a pretty clear split um, on, on that view. Um, but you can see very few people think governments are doing too much and that almost nobody believes that EVs are just as bad as gas cars for the environment. And, and the reason that last one's so important is we did hear, and we, I think we everyone on this call are, communicates in the space and, and is thinking about policy in the space. You always hear that one person who says, ah, oh, what about the batteries, right? How bad are the batteries for the environment or where are those batteries um, you know, the, the lithium for those batteries um, mined and, and how are they mined? And that came up every now and then in our conversations. But for the most part, this, what this shows is on balance, despite some of the uh, downsides to EVs, uh, people believe that they are not equivalent to gas powered vehicles and that they are better for the environment. Moving forward, over to you, Trevor. All right, thanks, David. Yeah, I personally think EVs are more fun to drive, but uh, I'm biased. Um, and uh, yeah, just getting back, you know, you talked about Hamilton. That was a really interesting one because we had a focus group that had a lot of people from Hamilton in it, and they knew all about the DeFasco plant and the green steel making that was happening there. 
and they knew more than we did, right? And, and that's something where if you pull that nationally or even provincially, you're just not going to see that data point. And it's only when you speak to people that are actually from a region that have like that have friends or family members who work in the industry um, where it's, it's so effective. So just good rule that, uh, you know, local examples can be really effective, but you're, you're not always going to get that in like a national poll or something. So this research really helps sort of dig that out. Um, so before we dive into some of the specific arguments we tested, I think it's important to note that these arguments are grounded in reality, which is to say that a number of studies really do find that the energy transition will make energy less expensive for you, not more expensive. Um, these trends aren't hard to explain, even if you're spending more on electricity, a lack of fossil fuel costs and improvements in energy efficiency add up to net savings. So here in front of you, the International Energy Agency expects average household energy bills in advanced economies to decline between 2020 and 2050. Uh, and you see even steeper declines if governments achieve their net zero ambitions by 2050. Fly through this quickly. Uh, on the next slide, uh, you'll see modeling from, has it moved over? There we go. Our next slide, you see modeling from, this is from the Canadian Climate Institute and uh, our friends at Navius Research. We work with them a lot as well. Uh, they also found that a Canadian spend a smaller percentage of their incomes on energy en route to net zero. So very similar trend here in Canada as the IEA expects to see uh, internationally. Uh, move on to the next slide. So this is, these are electricity rates. So already in Canada, provinces with the cleanest electricity grids tend to have the lowest electricity costs in the country, while provinces highly dependent on fossil fuels actually charge rate pairs the most. Um, of course, I should add that uh, there will be costs associated with adding more clean electricity supply. Nonetheless, this is very interesting. And I think we're gonna see this play out in a more pronounced way this winter. Um, I'm seeing news stories now talking about uh, energy prices spiking over the winter. That's definitely gonna be a political issue, but it's not gonna be evenly felt. I think that's important, right? So if you, you're gonna have really a tale of two different kinds of families right now, right? So you can have someone who lives, myself, I, you know, drives an EV, lives in BC. So, you know, BC Hydro is the power supplier, it's regulated clean electricity. You know, I, I don't have natural gas heating as well. And so really protected from these cost swings and, and you know, my energy bill is probably a little more than a hundred bucks a month, including transportation. And then somebody who lives in Saskatchewan or whatever, natural gas heating, fossil fuel electricity, two SUVs, and they're spending seven, eight hundred bucks a month on energy. So you can have two families living pretty similar lives, playing, paying extraordinarily different amounts on energy. So when we talk about clean energy saving you money, it's not just a future idea that might be achieved 10 years from now. It's the case for many people in Canada who, you know, in some cases are, are not paying very much in energy versus families who are paying a lot in energy because of in large part their exposure to fossil fuels. Um, next slide here. And then of course, electric vehicles. Uh, Clean Energy Canada analyzed a number of popular uh, EVs and gas cars earlier this year. You might've seen a report and we compared the ownership costs over eight years. And most of these vehicles, most of the EVs end up being thousands, in some cases, even tens of thousands of dollars cheaper over that eight year ownership period. Um, and on the next slide, we actually polled 1500 Ontarians with Abacus uh, back in May. So this is quantitative as opposed to qualitative. Uh, shortly after a report came out and we found that of those 1500 Ontarians we polled, 63%, so almost two thirds believe that electric vehicles are cheaper than gas cars when you consider the full cost of ownership like fuel and maintenance. So when you, when you get them to think about the big picture, they actually are at a place now where most of them think it's gonna be cheaper. And interesting, this is in a province with low EV adoption. I think it's just over 5% now uh, in Ontario, whereas Quebec and BC are well into the teens in terms of uh, EV percentage of car sales going toward EVs. Um, and finally, I just quickly, you know, none of this even touches on the avoided costs of climate change. That's perhaps the biggest bill of all. Um, but don't be surprised when people are more focused on their immediate day-to-day -day living costs. And we do need to speak to people at that level in ways that are engaging and relatable. So how do we do that? A part of this research, as part of this research, we tested arguments. Uh, we did this a couple of ways. We asked them to tell us whether they found certain arguments persuasive. And after showing them these arguments, we checked to see if their overall, overall views had shifted. So on the next slide here, um, 
you'll see that these participants were largely supportive of the clean energy transition going into this. Um, and so we didn't have much room to go up really, right? Like this is the first ask. So we asked them this question before we sort of exposed them to a number of arguments that might persuade them. And then we re-asked them again to see if their opinion had shifted. And, you know, it, it shifted slightly, maybe that's one or two people, um, but they, they were coming from a place of, they already bought it for the most part. Um, you know, these are people that they believe in climate change. They probably believe that climate action is good for the economy, but do they think it's good for the pocketbook? Next slide. So this tells a very different story. And this is why I think this is our Achilles heel. And this is why we're having this webinar. When we asked them this the first time without any priming, without any exposure to the arguments, just did they think the clean energy transition was gonna um, cost them more or less in their day-to-day -day life? You see that a majority of people thought it was going to cost them more. Um, you know, ex but exposure to a number of arguments that we're going to get talk about soon shifted that 29 points. And in the case of people who said it would cost them a lot more, we actually cut that number in half from 19% to 8%. It's still a lot of red. Uh, you know, if we have an Achilles heel, an area where we really need to shift Canadian assumptions over the next three years, you know, I think this is it. Um, so on that note, let's uh, quickly look at arguments that worked best for people. So we uh, presented participants with arguments for why the transition to clean energy is said to be cheaper overall than sticking with fossil fuel energy. We asked how persuasive they considered each of these arguments. And the single most persuasive argument why you're here, I'll read it to you. Because, quote, because clean energy is powered by electricity produced and regulated in Canada, we have more control over its price, whereas oil prices are swayed by countries like Russia and Saudi Arabia. David will show you the exact numbers on that momentarily. Uh, when participants asked why they agreed with this statement, reasoning revolved around having more control over gas, energy prices, many cited uh, rising gasoline prices is an, is an example of what happens when beholden to the global market. Now, our third best performing argument was actually similar in that it also invoked this theme of energy security. And that was, quote, clean energy means no longer being at the whims of oil companies and their shareholders. Also a persuasive frame for people. A couple more high performers quickly here. Uh, more energy efficient building codes and household appliances will ensure that less energy is wasted. We've actually, I've actually seen in other focus groups that waste is a really powerful frame. Sometimes we don't think to use it when talking about climate action. It sounds like recycling, but waste is something that people really inherently get. And I think when you can talk about the, this waste in the climate through a climate lens, it can be quite persuasive to people. And no surprise here, electric vehicles are significantly cheaper to fuel than gas cars. That's a very easy one for people to understand. So on the solution side, we also tested a number of policy ideas for how we can offset the cost of living, living specifically with climate solutions. There would be other solutions, of course, to help the cost of living, but we're just testing the climate ones. In general, the ideas we put forward, forward were quite popular, including uh, you know, more public EV charging stations, continuing or introducing a provincial EV rebate, which they don't have right now, uh, requiring new homes and buildings to be more energy efficient, also popular, and a shift toward 100% Canadian produced clean electricity, which of course ties into the argument that people found most effective around energy security. So uh, I will now pass it back to David to add some final observations and thoughts around, uh, around messaging. Great. Thanks, Trevor. I mean, one of the things we need to keep in mind when these groups were being done, when this research was being done, consumers had just experienced like whiplash when it comes to, for example, gas prices, where only a few months earlier, you know, at least in Ontario, I was seeing gas prices at like 60, 70 cents a liter. And then within a year, year and a half of that, we're up over two, two and a half dollars a liter, right? Like it, it was this crazy black and white worlds where we couldn't imagine, we couldn't believe how cheap gas had become and then couldn't believe how expensive it has become. So this notion of energy security I think, and, and the war, uh, the invasion of, the, of Ukraine and, and, and all the tensions going on and the debate around energy security in Europe exported itself over to Canada um, in a way that I don't think we've ever, at least in my lifetime, if you think most of the country right now hadn't been alive during the, you know, the, um, 
the the embargoes in in the 70s around oil and the stagflation like we're, we're kind of feeling like we're getting back to that kind of world again but for most canadians they've not experienced that kind of insecurity around energy and we didn't have solutions back then there were no alternatives there was no you know uh, alternative real alternative ways of of producing the same kind of energy or, or moving us from from point a to b and so this notion of price consistency and being in control having consistent prices that um, are not set by a war, aren't set by a cartel, aren't set by, is now particularly meaningful for people. And that's why we found that these messages uh, at this moment were particularly powerful. And I don't think they're gonna go away. Hopefully the war ends very soon, but if it doesn't and that, that notion of global insecurity continues, um, this is gonna be a really powerful moment. Now, it's not the only time we've had it in the last say 30 years, but it's been really acute. And I think it's important to, to note that. The second point that's really important about the transition that I think we learned also is, look, almost everybody that we spoke to, and again, if you look at the general population, I would say it's close to 70 to 80% of the public believes that this transition is going to happen anyways, that we have to do it. Because if we don't, we're going to get more extreme weather. This, this, the planet's going to be less hospitable. You, know, you don't have to go through all the reasons, but people understand the consequences in real terms. More so now, even in Canada, after the hurricanes that hit um, eastern eastern Atlantic Canada, and which was done after what happened after this this research, and so people then can say, oh, if it's going to happen, let's take advantage of it and seize it. Especially if we can get them to a point where they feel less vulnerable to the short term costs of this, um, and that I think is is really the big takeaway. If we go to the next slide, I can show you again, you know, the actual breakdown of some of the the actual results, and you'll see. We're asking people here, do you think this is a persuasive, somewhat persuasive, not persuasive arguments? First off, very few in our community thought any of these were not persuasive, but there were where we're making our you know, subjective conclusions are on, on the intensity difference between those at the top and those at the bottom, right? So it's not to say those at the bottom are bad or um, unpersuasive arguments. It's just in the context of our conversation, those at the top were much better. So again, it's around... Um, you know, being able to have locally produced, locally controlled, um, consistent pricing, um, energy efficient codes and building um, and appliances will produce less uh, energy and, and, and waste less energy. And this idea that we are not going to be at the whims of oil companies, um, again, in the context of consumers feeling ripped off, by the way, um, is, is, a, is a very powerful motivator for them to be uh, convinced that the clean energy transition ultimately will save them money. So I think you can see more of these, but I guess, you know, just to wrap, and then we'll, we'll go to the concluding slide together, Trevor, is a, we, we've come to a, a point where perhaps we would think that the rising cost of living, the inflationary crisis that we're in would be deeply, um, uh, vulnerable to the cause of climate action and, and clean energy transition, right? That was our assumption, perhaps, or a, a, not a hypothesis, but an assumption we wanted to test. On the flip side, though, those same forces that created the inflationary crisis, whether that be the pandemic and now a war in Europe, have actually created the, con the, the, the context by which people can more easily mobilize and, and understand why a clean energy transition needs to happen probably more quickly um, even if it's going to cost them a little bit of money in the short term. So um, if, we, if we skip to the last slide and, and wrap our things up, um, you know, I'm not going to go through all these, uh, Trevor, you can jump in as well. But I think what I learned most from the conversations, and as Trevor alluded to earlier, by having localized populations in which we could understand the local on the ground experience is that specific specific examples really does help make the transition real. It takes it from this abstract, you know, theory to specific examples. And the EVs, as number 0.3 says, is the most powerful image. It's the most obvious for people. Um, they, they see it happening. People are talking about it. They're, 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 they're you know, considering adopting uh, this when they buy their next vehicle. And so it's in the lexicon. It's in their conversations. There's still work to do to, to demonstrate the proof points that, that, that Trevor uh, noted. But I think at the end of the day, cost of living is still a threat 
to the clean energy transition in the short term. I do think political opponents, uh, political entrepreneurs, as I'll call them, maybe that's too kind of word to use, will try and are trying to, you know, to, to make the link. But I think with effective communication, you know, though the majority of the country who are on side, the vast majority who are on side to act uh, against, uh, against climate um, can be defended against those those arguments can be defended against if if the if you know based on our, our work here today so uh trevor i'll hand it over to you to, to, to add to to all of that sure yeah i'll send a quick uh story i think to you know make this point you just made about things being tangible and hopefully people won't hear my cat meowing at the door um so this was back in 2019 we connected some focus groups with a bc-based firm uh, we hosted a few in Metro Vancouver. We had a Kamloops group as well. And we assumed when we assumed the Kamloops group would be the least climate friendly. But on my way over to the hotel from the airport in Kamloops, I spoke to my cab driver about the forest fires and how they had impacted the city. We didn't really talk about climate change explicitly, but he told me that uh, kids' soccer games had been canceled. He said you couldn't open your window because the smoke was so bad. And if you didn't own an air conditioner, you felt like a prisoner in your own home. Those are the words he used. So in our Vancouver groups, we talked about the impacts of climate change at a global level, and it didn't really resonate with participants. So this time I simply told them what my cab driver had told me. And they just picked that conversation up. Everyone in that room had a story, in the same way that our Hamilton group had you know, talked about the steel mill there. You know, this is about climate change though. Their heads were nodding. This wasn't an abstract threat. This was, a, this was real for them. This was a lived experience and it was a shared experience. Um, so, you know, when is climate change communications at its most effective? Personally, I, I boil it down to three maxims. One, the more local it is, the more people care. Two, the more tangible it is, the more people understand. And three, the more what you're selling offers people a sense of security, the more they want to believe it. So whether it's a flood, a fire, or a new EV manufacturing facility, opening up, the closer to home it happens, the more people care. An electric car, something people can see, touch, and even own, will capture people's attention in a way that carbon taxes never will. And a future that protects our way of life, rather than upending it, is the future most people want. And that includes a future they can afford. So enough from me, we'll turn it to you now. Uh, once again, feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many as we can. I apologize if we don't get to them all, truly. My colleague, Carrie, now has been going through your questions and uh, she's going to join us and uh, ask them on your behalf. Uh, thanks, Trevor and David. That was that was really interesting. Um, so, yeah, I encourage you all to, to add your questions to the Q&A um, box at the bottom. Um, we've had a few questions in. Um, First one, so given these respondents were based in Ontario, um, how much do you think these views are consistent across provinces and territories, um, and how much could we realistically ex extrapolate to the rest of the country? I uh, don't know if you want to go first, David? Yeah, I will. Um, I mean, I think, again, some of the local understanding around things like green uh, steel and, and, you know, the economic upside to EV manufacturing, that's a pretty local kind of uh, phenomenon and I think would be different in other parts of the country. But I think the overall story, this is, you know, would be would be consistent with obvious regional variation, you know, difference between Alberta and BC. And, and that's primarily driven by, I think, the salience of the issue of climate action, as opposed to a belief that green, you know, a clean energy transition could save you money in the long run. So I think what we learned is that the relationship between these two variables is probably, I think, consistent everywhere, dependent on what your underlying views are around some of these other issues, right? Um, and your, your your lifestyle. So, so you know, Trevor often mentioned in our presentation today the unique circumstances of Ontario not having a provincial rebate for EVs or frankly, having a political leadership in our province who doesn't talk a lot about climate change and, you know, embraces the economic upside, but doesn't talk about, you know, ways of uh, how, how a, a transition could be more affordable. In fact, had, you know, for years campaigned against the carbon price. Um, so I think there will be unique circumstances based on the political, economic, and social environments. But I think that the, the key learnings are applicable, um, like, across the country, um at, at at the core level 
Yeah, I quickly add to, I mean, in this case, we did Ontario specifically for a few reasons. We wanted to dig down some economic opportunities that were very regionally relevant. I, I would also question, I, I, I'm not saying that there's this assumption here, but when you think about like, what's the national opinion, ask why you want to know what the national opinion is, because you're going to get a region like Alberta heavily weighting the, the whole and making it look like people are often less supportive of something than they actually are. And so you don't, the national opinion is often not going to be the same as the Ontario opinion or the BC opinion. And um, it depends why you want to know this. Do you want to know this because you're curious how an election might play out? Well, Alberta tends to go very blue, whereas the 905 in Southern Ontario, where we did a lot of this work, tons and tons of swing ridings. So, you know, what the national opinion is versus what the opinion is in Southern Ontario, there's a reason we were curious, or a few reasons why we were curious why, what the opinions were in Southern Ontario. I'll just add too, just because Alberta, you know, always comes up. I think what we also learned, what I learned from this is when you actually have local, examples of how uh, an embedded long-term industry is transitioning and it will not threaten jobs in fact might create more opportunity you get buy-in right so there is lessons here for industry in alberta to be able to demonstrate to local populations that look we're do if you do this and this and this you know even though you know we probably need to to, to, to ramp down production not ramp it up in a cleaner way there's ways of, of helping and, 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 and bringing and getting buy-in from local populations to, 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 to you know, accelerate that transition. Alberta's, a, I know, harder nut to crack, but I, I think it's possible. Um, so we've got a question now um, about sort of, I guess, mo moving on from your point there uh, about how sp specific or local um, these cost of living arguments should be. So, um, you know, what are the spe what specifics are most salient to knock people against those arguments? So that's the argument that cost of living um, is still a threat. Um, so I, I think first that the cost of living problem is not actually localized. I think it's, it's universal, uh, pretty universal. Um, now, obviously, you know, things like the price of, of fuel might be slightly different depending on what region or province you're in, but it's only marginally so. It's not fundamentally different. Um, what is different, and, and therefore the solutions that we presented actually aren't local, right? The idea of having control, having a consistent price, you know, producing um, energy, uh, clean energy uh, domestically, um, I think is applicable everywhere. Um, now, some provinces, for example, like Ontario, Manitoba, BC, have a better understanding of what clean energy is, um, and and so can 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 clearly visualize it and and feel confident that a, that a transition is not going to, uh, you know, uh, that if they buy an EV that they're not going to be you know charging that EV with quote dirty energy uh, or electricity. But again, I, I I think that the overall connection between affordability and the in the transition um, isn't isn't uh, the economic upside is, but the overall uh, relationship isn't local. Um, I think it's a, a universal kind of understanding that we've, we've brought here. Yeah, I'll, I'll one thought to that though, and it depends on what you mean by local or thinking regionally here, but there's something local about an electric vehicle and that it's a vehicle that you, that's locally in your garage, right? Like you, you own it and you actually see the cost savings on your bills as opposed to when the arguments it did less well was about falling renewable prices. That argument assumes that people are going to see those savings passed down to them. So it's more distant from them, whereas something like an EV is something that actually, or a carbon tax rebate or something, that's a savings that they get directly. So there's, when I talk about like local and, and, and for example, I also mean things that are very much near to their life experience versus things that they feel removed from. Okay, and so um, a question here about, um, who the messengers should be. Is there any research around who the messengers should be? Uh, should it be industry, industry or government tends to be low on the trust scale? So if it's not them, who else? We did, uh, we did some, I'm just going into the report. Trevor, if you wanna, I'm gonna get the actual. Uh... Oh yeah, we did ask uh, what, how much they trusted different uh, messengers. I think environmental groups did pretty good actually. <laughs> They did. They, so we asked the question, how much influence has the following had on your perceptions of clean energy, of the clean energy transition? And, and right at the top of the list uh, were environmental organizations with 
you know, almost 80 plus percent saying they've had either a big or moderate influence on them. The clean energy industry itself, so the producers of, you know, either the, the, the scientists behind the technology, the producers of the technology have a lot of credibility. And interestingly, even though they're under a lot of pressure these days, the news media um, were, were said to be influential in people's thinking. Um, you know, less so, and keep in mind this was in Ontario, the provincial government in Ontario had very little credibility because it's not seen, I think, uh, as credible on the issue. Um, family and friends, eh, kind of, but people I think aren't sure they know what they're talking about all the time. And then the oil and gas industry, interestingly, were kind of uh, very polarizing, right? You had some who said no way, they've had no influence, and others who said they have. Now, influence doesn't mean positive influence either. It could also mean they've they framed my thinking because of things that they've done or said. So, but the but the but I think the story here is that you know um, anyone who says that. Canadians, generally Ontarians, don't trust environmental organizations um, are usually the people who are opposed to everything you're saying. Um, generally, all the research I've done suggests people do value, um, you know, the research and the perspective that, that they do provide. And, um, and that's confirmed in our research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do think, you know, I know the news media is, is often attacked, but I think that, that again, can skewer perceptions about level of, I think, trust in the news media and the fact that most of us read news every single day. So I, I still do think that uh, getting this in the news, getting it in the right way is, is absolutely critical. And um, maybe do people don't trust some of their friends on giving them informed information about, you know, the energy transition at a macro level. But I think when it comes to talking about, hey, this EV is saving me 300 bucks a month on fuel, I do think that's going to be really effective for people. And uh, which is why I think that sometimes uh, action often precedes opinion uh, when it comes to these things, as opposed to somebody coming up with like a moral perspective and then modifying their behavior to conform to this view that they now hold for logical reasons. It's often the opposite. So if somebody buys a vehicle because they think it's going to save the money, then I actually think there's a chance that the, some of their other views will sort of fall in line with this behavioral choice they've just made, um, which is why I think, you know, getting more electric vehicles on the road is not just a climate solution in that it cuts transportation emissions. Absolutely it is. But I actually think it's a way to shift public opinion. I think when people have literally bought in to the clean energy transition, they're going to be more susceptible and less resistant to policies like carbon pricing. So I think exposure to their friends getting EVs, seeing that in their day-to-day -day life, that's going to help trigger that S curve. And I think as people sort of actually get these vehicles, they're going to be converted just because they have less reason to say no to something. And in some ways, like I said, they've invested in it. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so moving on from that now, um, got a question. Did your sample include Canadians who are strongly convinced of climate action and who are alarmed about climate change? Um, so, and I guess, you know, if not, you could elaborate on, on, on why. So just unclear, like, did it include folks who are deeply concerned and want like the most sort of motivated on, on climate? That was, uh, yeah, I, I presume, you know, the sort of highly engaged portion, um, yeah, so so the only thing that prevented you from participating is you like didn't believe in climate change um, and and saw no like no way of, of of even if you believed it no way of 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 solving it. Um, so we did have some people in the community uh, in the groups who were more engaged in the issue than others, but um, yes, we had some included. Um, okay. in, in the conversation. Um, the, the, the person who asked the question has, has clarified, uh, you exclude climate deniers. Did you did your sample include Canadians who are strongly convinced? So I guess it's, did we exclude any from the other, other end of the spectrum? No, we didn't. No, we didn't. Yeah, we included them uh, in this. But I would say the, the majority of those who participated were, were more in the middle, right? They, they believed it was happening. They thought it was important, but it wasn't like to, to all end, which is why I think you saw you know, the, the, that real shift that, that Trevor showed in that one question where you had most people thought like, you know, the, the, the transition was going to cost them money, cost them more, um, but they were at least open to being persuaded, which is what really the goal was. So we, we didn't exclude people, but we didn't, um, who, who had hard views in the positive direction, but we, there weren't many of them in the group. Okay. Um, and then uh, did did you consider fairness within the broader issue of affordability? Hmm. 
I don't think we really explored fairness. Yeah. No, not really. Um, okay, and then another question. Uh, did you test arguments about um, public transit? So. I don't no, we did. I, I don't think we did. Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely a solution and affordability for some. I think in some cases it's a bit trickier because especially somebody outside of Toronto and a lot of people we were actually talking to were not in like Toronto proper. Um, and uh, some people would view transit as like a, a lifestyle sacrifice as opposed to like a technology switch. So it would kind of, it's, it's a different, it is definitely a solution, but uh, we didn't focus on it in this work. Okay, um, and then, um, so a question I think um, framed around, um, now EVs are kind of headed more towards the mainstream, so to speak, um, you know, what, what would be the next kind of um, issue that people could be convinced on, and uh, specifically around would, would home energy efficiency be a more impactful argument than EVs in the future? I can weigh on this one because we've, we've, we've toyed with energy efficiency before and um, you know, Efficiency Canada is a great organization if you ever have questions about this. Um, efficiency is interesting because it's something that I find generally polls well, and it, and it did in, in, in our, I mean, it's qualitative, but when we asked people, it, it did, as I showed you earlier, it was quite popular. Um, but we've always struggled to make it break through when we try to get it out there as a message. So there's a difference between something that polls well and something that engages people. Um, and energy efficiency is sort of the classic case. In my experience of something that consistently polls well, people like it. I think they even understand it, but it's hard to get a post on social media about energy efficiency to do well. It's hard to get the mainstream media to run a story about a report on energy efficiency. It's just hard to get it out there. So I think that's, it should be message, but um, I've always struggled with um, getting energy efficiency out there in the news and getting awareness high, and whereas EVs, it's just so effective. It's not just that electric vehicles are, are popular and that they pull well, but that they also go viral on social media. Then, you know, and mainstream news media loves stories about EVs. I mean, Globe Mail, I, I swear I see an EV story on the front page every single day now. Um, so that's, I think that's one of the challenges with energy efficiency is people just don't think it's fun enough to to want to talk about it or cover it even though it's even though people like it um it's similar with heat pumps heat pumps did not do that well uh when we talked about it here also heat pumps are not pr probably fewer people where getting a heat pump is going to make sense for them versus an ev um but uh, certainly we do need to i think we do need to talk about energy efficiency more like we do need to help people understand that this is part of the part of the picture and fundamentally that you know when you cut fossil fuels from your life that that's actually going to save you money and i think if people actually thought about that it took a moment to thought about that they would actually go oh yeah but they're not thinking about it unless prompted to mm -hmm. okay i think we probably got time for one final question um so do you have any insight into what types of programs people are supportive of to tackle affordability directly for example rebates loans economy-wide carbon pricing price fees freezes etc i don't know if you want to take that on david or i am well i mean i think from this research and other stuff that i've done um certainly the, the notion of a rebate i think is quite popular i mean i think we we heard a lot of feedback that Ontario lacked a rebate, for example, on EVs, that, that, that they felt that was, especially since that upfront cost was viewed as such a barrier to buying one, that, you know, we found that if, 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 that, if more rebates were there, people would do it. They also supported generally uh, governments providing more rebates. So I think, you know, if you want people to uh, behave in a particular way, rebates are good. I don't know if people view it as a as a solution to affordability, um, you know, I think governments are, 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 are struggling with this question on, you know, how to alleviate the pressure that people are feeling. I've done research in the past, for example, uh, for other organizations that, that shows the public is widely in favor of government imposing price controls, right? Like it, it almost like there is no bounds to what people would accept if it lowers the price for them, even if ideologically you'd think they would be opposed to something like that. Uh, when people are feeling anxious, uh, when they feel, for example, that corporations, including oil companies, are generally greedy, right? You saw this week, Loblaws uh, announced, you know, freezing the price of their no-name brand 
um, in this kind of fight within the, the grocery world, um, they're under political pressure because you've got political leaders who are saying, we, you know, we need to, 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 to expose sort of the greed that's in that industry. There is deep suspicion. Um, and we, we heard this in our focus groups when it comes to corporations generally. Um, and so anything that government does to kind of rein in that, um, I think is quite popular. In fact, if you look at what's going on in the UK, we haven't heard this conversation as much in Canada, but you know, if you saw it today, the PM resigned. So it's just generally chaos in the UK. But um, you know, they've gone from having a government that was going to bring in you know a, a windfall tax on on oil companies to help alleviate the cost of living crisis when it comes to energy. They flip flopped, went back and forth, and now you've got Labour, the opposition party, basically coming out with a pretty strong plan. And interestingly. Um, have called for a, a state-run, state-owned agency to drive clean energy consumption. And, and so there's a perfect example about how the politics of affordability um, is being linked up with, which is driven by energy prices, which is being, I think, accelerating support for the transition. So I don't think your question was about politics, but I think my answer is uh, people will accept pretty much anything that they feel will, will save them money. Yeah, uh, looks like we're at time. I'll quickly add, though, I think there's a difference between affordability and accessibility to that affordability. An EV may, change, may save you money over time, but if you don't have the money to buy an EV up front or financing is more expensive for you because you're lower income or whatever, that's an issue. So an electric vehicle rebate, for example, that makes something more accessible. It may already be more affordable in the long run, but accessibility like a rebate helps you take advantage of that affordability. So that's all I'll say, because we've run out of time. I apologize, I know there are questions we didn't get to. Unfortunately, that's always the case. Feel free to follow up with me if you'd like. Um, and I will bring this webinar to a close. I personally like to thank my co-host, David Coletto, for joining me today, as well as my colleague, Carrie McNamara, for producing this webinar. Uh, there, there is an email uh, coming with a copy of this recording. I think some of you asked about that. A uh, summary of our findings as well in a short survey that will take less than three minutes of your time. Again, feel free to share what you saw today. Um, and thank you. Thank you all for joining today. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye, everyone.